Hello and welcome to another video. In this one, we're gonna be talking about space-time distortions in Pokemon Legends Arceus, the game that came out a few weeks ago, but I've definitely not been spending a lot of my time playing. Uh, but we're gonna be talking about space-time distortions and how they work, and I'm gonna show you a little bit of code that I wrote to automate them. Um, so without further ado, let's jump into that. Okay, so this is going to be using a project that I have been using before. This uh, microcontroller, oh, that was the wrong scene. There's the right scene. Uh, this microcontroller, which I've done a few videos on in the past, I'm gonna briefly go over how that works right now. Um, it is a little microcontroller. This is commonly used in keyboards, and there's a UART device, which allows me to convert serial to talk to the controller, and the controller connects into my switch and acts like a, kind of like a wired pro controller. This is kind of a, the diagram here. I've used this in the past to uh, reset for shiny Pokemon or to um, get an authentic Sinistee. I'll link those videos in the description. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about space-time distortions, which uh, we've only recently understand more of the mechanics of. Basically the way it works is the game will decide how far in the future a uh, space-time distortion will spawn, and if you don't access the menu or battle or other stuff like that, that timer will tick down and eventually it will trigger a space-time distortion. Unfortunately, this kind of means that you just have to wait for them to show up. Uh, and if you're not paying very close attention, you can just miss them. Basically, when they show up, they will be a message that looks like this. It will tell you a space-time distortion seems to be forming, and then you'll have a few minutes to scurry over to the bubble and catch the unique Pokemon that live there. Um, so what I decided to do is take my little microcontroller project and use that to press buttons on the switch, uh, but also feed the video into my computer through my capture card and watch for this little message to show up. And when it shows up, I'll set off an alarm on this. I'm gonna walk you through the code of that and then I'm gonna show you it working in reality. Um, and actually, if we look at our um, I guess we'll just start with the code. Yeah, code's fairly straightforward. Uh, so this does a lot of stuff with accessing uh, webcams via CV2, which is a computer vision library. Uh, and this is kind of the, the main chunk of the code here. Set up the CV2 capture, uh, set up a serial port. That's how I communicate with the controller. Um, set a little thing which periodically opens the menu and closes it. This is basically just to prevent the switch from going to sleep in the middle of it, because uh, you wouldn't want that. Um, actually, let me hook this up right now and kind of show you how you can press commands on it. Grab some USB cables here. So the one from the computer goes into the smaller port here. You're probably not gonna be able to see this, but that's why there's the picture on GitHub, and I'll put the link to GitHub in the description. Uh, on the actual switch, you have to enter into this menu here, change grip slash order, and you'll plug in the other USB cable into the switch. I just have my switch on a dock over there, and you plug this in like so, and then it should boot into the game automatically. I'm basically pressing the L and R to pair the controller, and then exiting out and then entering the game. And the, the controller is doing that all magically. Uh, and now if we were to run commands here, we can actually press buttons. So if we do Python 3, wires on the keyboard, press, for instance, if we want to open the minus menu, we can do that, we can press B, and we can play around with a real copy of the game running on a real switch, uh, which is pretty cool. But then I wrote this uh, special code here, which you know does that same menuing, uh, but it basically waits for this message to show up here and tries to look at it in a very particular box. Uh, so if we were to, let's see if we can actually walk out of, uh, walk to a particular region here. Okay, there's a mass outbreak and we're gonna go, we can actually probably just go straight to the one we're on right now. Cool, uh, so once we have gone to a particular camp, uh, we're able to run this script here. Basically what it's going to do is it's going to find a chunk of the screen and try and look for white pixels inside of it. 
Uh, so for instance, if we run this script now, Python 3-nstd, base time distribution, uh, you'll see that it's looking at this chunk right here, this little red area. It's trying to find this particular message, the space time distortion seems to be forming. And if it finds that, it will set off an alarm, uh, which sounds something like this. Uh, sleep 0.5. It's really loud in real life. I don't know if it's going to show up on here. I will open this up so you can hear it. Um, but yeah, anyway, it sets off an alarm when it finds the actual message has been sent there. Uh, let me show you a video of one where I was able to catch it in, in the act earlier. Uh, so here's one where we're running the program. And uh, after a while, the message will show up here. And the program will notice it, and it'll set off the, the beeping alarm. And that's how I can notice when the space-time distortions appear. Basically, I can set up the program, AFK, and uh, yeah, see it noticed the, the white text in there and found the space-time distortion. Uh, but anyway, that's, um, that's what I wanted to show you today. And uh, I'll have links in the description if you want to either build the thing yourself, uh, or if you send me a DM, I can probably put one together for you. Uh, but yeah, hopefully you enjoyed and I'll see you around.